Texas Crossroads of North America by Jesus de la Teja, Ron Tyler, and Nancy Beck, Chapter 5, Mexican, Texas, 1821 to 1835. He had been unsure of the venture at first, so much so that his father had written, I hope and pray you will discharge your doubts as to the enterprise. Trusted friends had been enthusiastic and all the arrangements had been made. In the Nachochotes, Louisiana, a delegation headed by Erasmo Seguin met 27-year-old Stephen Fuller Austin and in July 1821 escorted him across the Sabine into Spanish Texas where he was met his where he was to meet his father Moses and commence their colonizing work <clears throat> barely had the traveling party started though then word came from Moses's death in Missouri now it would be up to Stephen F. Austin himself to found the Anglo colony that had been his father's dream. As the party moved deep into the interior of Texas to the Brazos River and beyond, he encountered few settlers. Aside from the reduced settlement of the Nacajoches, through which he had passed, most of the Tejano population was concentrated along the San Antonio River. He saw no Indians. Austin noted with enthusiasm the abundant wildlife, the fertile soil, the clearing, the clear running waters, or I'm sorry, clear running rivers, the pleasing way in which the woodland alternated with prairie he was bound for San Antonio, hoping and trusting that the Mexican officials there would allow him to carry out his father's deathbed with wish that his son replace him in the Texas enterprise. Outside the town, an advance party returned with the news that Mexico had declared its independence and Texas was no longer under Spanish rule. This news posed another complication for Austin, but by now he was fully committed to the vision of, the, of an Anglo-American colony flourishing in Texas. His work toward that end would prove crucial to the reshaping of redefining of Texas. How to explain the world welcome. I'm sorry, how to explain the welcome that Stephen F. Awesome received from Tejano leadership and even from many within Mexico's post-independence elite. Looking back from the early 21st century, it seems logical for Mexicans to have supported a colonization, colonizing project that would bring culturally alien people to a land that Mexicans had yet to fully control. Mexicans, in fact, were aware, well aware of their neighbors' expansionist activities. Between 1803 and 1819, the United States had absorbed one piece of Spain's North American do domains after another. In some cases, for instance, in what are now known as the Florida parishes of Louisiana, the acquisition had been accomplished through the introduction of settlers who waited until the right moment to declare independence. Quickly asking for annexation, the area had been incorporated into the United States at the start of the War of 1812. Now here came American settlers into a region that had been Spanish territory, but which until recently had been acclaimed by the United States as part of the Louisiana Purchase. Why did Mexicans not see the American annexation through the settlement process beginning all over to again in Texas? In part, the answer lies in the few options open to the to Mexicans, whether frontier Tejanos or Mexico city statement. A decade of insurgency and Indian warfare had undone decades to, of work to bring even the modicum, modicum of Hispanic civilization. In what to what, despite Austin's first impressions, very much remained American Indian country. Where would the resources come from to rebuild what had been to what had been and to develop what might be the nascent nation of Mexico, as you will see, suffered mightily 
in the first years, its political, economic, and social tra travails led to wild go swings in government and to neglect of the economic fundamentals of territorial integrity for Tejanos. Then Anglo-Americans represented a possible way out of the abyss into which the province had fallen the previous decade. For Mexico City, Anglo-Americans represented an inexpensive way of settling a frontier it otherwise was unprepared to develop or even properly defend. Both Tejano and Mexican elites at first believed that the partnership with the North Americans could be managed. And men like Stephen F. Austin said all the right things. They could not see that the overwhelming force of what soon would be would come to be called manifest destiny. Already had some Americans coming to Texas with very different agenda. She read this chapter, consider the following questions. How did the conditions in post-independence Mexico contribute to Texas forced union with Cohia? How did the reliance on impresarios to foster development of the region prove a blessing for Texas, but a curse for Mexico. Who were the centralists and federalists, and why did both Anglo and Mexican Texans tend to be in the federalist camp? The New Notion, 1821 to 1824. When Augustin de Iturbide marched into Mexico City to a triumphal reception in September 1821, little had been settled with regard to Mexico's future. While some leaders advocated for a complete break from Spain, others worked to retain a monarchical form of government. There was also question, uh, questions about race, status, and the relationship between far-flung jurisdiction and Mexico City, which from the beginning was regarded as the new nationals ca nation's capital. For Texas, all these questions were particularly relevant as the few thousand who could be considered Tejanos, Mexican Texans, shared a vastness of Texas with many more thousand indigenous people who could not. How would Texas and Texans fit into the new scheme of things? Politically instability following independence. The decade long struggle for independence had devastated Mexico, aside from the hundreds of thousands dead, silver mining, the engine of the economy was in ruins. Agriculture and the livelihood of the bulk of the population was in shambles. Some parts of the com com country were governed by military strongmen of uncertain loyalties. Despite the, the restoration of local governing bodies, the prov provincial deputations which had existed briefly under the constitution of 1812 in other parts the links to mexico city were so tenuous as to raise questions almost immediately about continued union with mexico among mexico's problems was the formation of a national government iturbide quickly named a provincial governing junta which turned around and named him its presiding officer. The junta then named a five-man regency to manage day-to-day -day affairs, and a turbide became one of its members. The junta and the Congress that replaced it were both do dominated by men supportive of a turbide. However, when the Congress began to take steps to cut back on the size and power of the military, a turbide intervened arranging for street demonstrations in which he was hailed as Augustin I, Emperor of Mexico. He humbly accepted the will of the people and on May 19, 1822, became constitutional emperor. The farce lasted less than a year. Perhaps a more gifted man might have made a convincing monarch, but a turbide was pretty and self-serving, with employment rising, debt mounting, and little sign that the government had any idea of how to fix the country's problems. A turbide's support waned, 
At the end of October, he dissolved Congress after a protest against his censorship and arrest of opposition members had turned the, the majority against him. To create a facade of representative government, he selected a small group of congressmen to serve as a junta instituyente or governing council. In early December, the commander of the port of Veracruz, Brigadier Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana, began his career in political meddling by declaring himself against a turbide. In February 1823, anti-turbide conspirators issued the Plan de Casa Mata, calling for the end to a turbide's raid. Rain. Support for the Casa Mata plan spread quickly, and on March 19, 1823, Augustine I abdicated in short order. He was on board a ship bound for exile in Italy. An ill-considered attempt to return to Mexico a year later led to his arrest and execution the following July. In the course of 1823, the country moved from centralized monarchy to a federal republic. In July, the Central America provinces abandoned Mexico and no one tried to stop them. The restored provincial deputations demanded a new nation, national compact and so elections for a consti constituent Congress took place in the fall. When the new Congress met in November 1823, it, its composition and goals were very different than the Imperial Congress Unlike the majority of mon monarchical representatives in the first Congress, the majority now espoused Republican ideology. As more representative of the provincial deputations and local elites who selected them, most delegates were supporters of a system of government promoting strong states' rights. In effect, between 1821 and 1823, the ideological lines were drawn for me Mexican politics for the next half century. On one side were the centralists. They consisted of much of the hierarchy of the Catholic Church, a considerable portion of the army's command officers, and most of the business community tied to Mexico City's leading commercial houses. They argued that Mexico lacked experience in self-government and needed a strong central government to keep the country together. Some were mo monarchists, some were conservative Republicans. On the other side were the Federalists. They maintained that the provincial deputations, which represented the will of Mexico's regions, had already established local rule and that the decentralized power would prevent the rise of new dictators. Some were professionals and local elites, and some were members of lo the lower clergy and junior military officers as political parties failed to form. Like-minded men used Masonic lodges as the venues for, the, for their meetings, the centralist gathering under the Scottish right and the federalist under the York right not surprisingly, the, federate, the Federal Constitution of 1824, which would come to play a prominent role in Texas struggles for independence, reflected aspects American, French, and Spanish political thought. To the, United, to the U.S. Constitution, it owed a government structure with separate executive, legislative, and judicial branches. Rejecting the awkward idea of a plural executive, it called for the separate election of a single president and vice president by the legislators of the respective states. Congress was to be bicameral, with the lower house representing the population and a senate representing the states equally, reflecting its Spanish heritage and, its con and in concession to the centralists, the Constitution declared the Catholic faith, <clears throat> the only religion of the country, and granted the clergy and military their furos, that is, judicial autonomy, that made them subject only to the legal structures of their respective institutions. 
Texas in the new order. When Father Refugio de la Garza, San Antonio's parish priest and a native of the town, arrived in Mexico City in 1822 as Texas delegate to the Imperial Congress, he came with a wish list reflecting Texas' desperate needs. Texas needed a military campaign against hostile Indians. It needed a string of presidios to provide a barrier against both Indian and foreign encroachments. It needed large numbers of settlers from the interior of the country. It needed final decommissioning of the remaining missions to open up productive land for development. Father de la Garza had some success. The colonization and secularization laws he supported passed but most of the, his or other efforts came to naught. He could not even get the government to address the needs of the troops already in Texas, let alone provide for the military expansion necessary to properly control the frontier. He especially lamented the wasted time and energy of a turbide's reign and was glad to see it go. In 1823, he wrote an optimistic letter to San Antonio's Ayuntamiento, or town council, that reflected self-government aspirations of so many. To repeat what I have written in my previous letters, arbitrariness is ended as our oppression, despotism, and tyranny. Today, Texas enjoys unlimited freedom without obstacles or hindrances. Texas may oppose of everything which prodigal nature has bestowed upon it, land and sea without regard to any laws other than those that the province may itself literally impose. Back in Texas, local elites took up the cause of home rule with enthusiasm. Within a month of Arturbide's abdication, they set up a junta gubernativa or governing council with seven representatives the San Anto from San Antonio and one from one each from La Bahia and Nagadoches. In the fall of 1823, Tejanos elected their own provincial deputation. The deputation in turn selected Erasmo Seguin, a longtime public figure and friendly to U.S. immigration. As Texas delegate to the Constitu Constituent Congress, having acquired a taste for local governance, Tejanos would be reluctant to give up. Give it up. Seguin spent almost a year in Mexico City, often suffering the provisions, private privations. Sorry, of someone representing the poorest portion of the new nation. At one point, he wrote to his wife, "I have no money." But I am not hungry, and I were, and were I hungry, I would not ask for help from my province, for she is more fit to receive help than to give it. His agenda was much the same as Father de la Garza's had been. Soon after his arrival, he realized that keeping the four northeastern provinces of the Tom Tamaulipas, Nueva Santander's new name. Nueva León, Cohia, and Texas together as a single political entity was unworkable. It was also clear that Texas, with its small population and underdevelopment, would not be accepted as a stand-alone state. In time, Seguin came to see that the national government dysfunction militated militated against territorial status. As he wrote to the Baron de Vestrop in 1824, <clears throat> the situation is bad, very bad. Every day the number of conspiracies increases and everyone is out to undo the government's order. Finally agreeing to union with Cohia, he had included in the degree a provision that gave Texas the option of petitioning for separate statehood when its population grew enough to warrant the move. Seguin also saw himself as an advocate for Anglo-American immigration on which he and uh, uh, other Tejano oligarchs were pinning their hopes for Texas prosperity. Fortunately, he served on the committee 
that produced the National Colonization Law of 1824, which left most of the, those matters in the hands of the states. To assuage the concerns of the suspicious of U.S. intentions, the law cert reserved to the national government approval for, of all foreign settlement within 20 league, 50 miles reserve along international borders and 10 leagues, 25 miles long the coast. Seguin also worked on behalf of their of the preservation of slavery as necessary to attract American of substance rather than just poor farmers. Congress settled on a vague prohibition of the slave trades on the issue of freedom of conscience. Seguin advised that there shall be no other cult other than the Christian Catholic, but that provision that applied only to public worship as even under the old government religious toleration was permitted texas warned it to its relationship with cohia with the new capital located at saltillo at the southern end of the state the reins of power were far from <clears throat> texas san antonio saw an <clears throat> immediate demotion in status and now became the scent the seat of government for the Department of Texas. With Hefe Politico in effect, a deputy governor appointed by the state governor as Anglo-American immigration changed the face of Texas. Tensions with both Saltillo and Mexico City rose, making the union with Cohia one of the principal grievances in the coming decade. Political and Economic Development on Mexico's Northeastern Frontier The Federalist reordering of Mexico also brought change to the Mexican communities along the Rio Grande, Paso del Norte, which had been part of New Mexico during the colonial period, was transferred to the jurisdiction of the state of Chihuahua. During the early independence era, Paso del Norte continued to grow and prosper despite increasing Apache attacks. Much of the growth was the result of booming commerce brought about by the Santa Fe trade as American merchants opened up commercial links between Missouri and New Mexico along what has come to be known as the Santa Fe Trail. There was a corresponding increase in trade along the Camino Real between Chihuahua and New Mexico. The new trade and accompanying growth created economic opportunities for men such as Juan Maria Ponce de Leon and Hugh Stevenson. Ponce de Leon received land grants from the Aramente Ayanta Miento of Paso del Norte on the north side of the Rio Grande in 1827 and established farming and ranching operations in what is now El Paso. Hugh Stevenson, an American fur trapper and teamster, also acquired land in the area in the mid-1820s and by 1826 had married the daughter of a prominent Paseño merchant. Even the devastating floods of 1829, which cut a new channel for the Rio Grande and left Isleto, Socorro, and San Elizario on what eventually would be the Texas side of the border, did not halt the area's development. Political and economic changes also came to the settlements of the lower Rio Grande Valley, where ties to Texas were more immediate. In 1825, Tom Tamalapis, which during the colonial period had been the province of Nuevo Santander, passed the colon uh, colonization law modeled on the one from neighboring Cohia e Texas, hoping to draw a similar type of settlement to the vast expanse between the Rio Grande and nu Nueces rivers. Although no Anglo-American colonization projects materialized, the generous provisions of the land law led to the founding of numerous ranching estates as far north as the Nueces by the mid-1830s. The expansion of the livestock industry in northern Tamaulipas 
always a risky proposition because of the environment, had come to a halt in the decade of independence struggle when Indian raids and insurgent warfare had disrupted ranching operations. For instance, Madaramas Moras, resident Enrique Villarreal, a royalist army officer who fought at the Battle of Medina, was forced to abandon his ranch at Rincón del Oso in Corpus Christi Bay in 1817 because of the raids. He reestablished the ranch in 1824 and acquired a title to over 40,000 acres from the T Tamalapias in 1831. For men such as Villarreal, the growing markets for livestock, especially hides and wool for export and horses and mules for domestic use, made the risks worthwhile. So did smuggling. Although much of the new trade at first took place through the port of Matamoros, which had opened to international trade in 1823, by 1828, an increasing amount of goods was coming in by way of Corpus Christi and then overland into the interior. High Mexican import tariffs on manufactured goods that competed with national manufacturers drove the smuggling. As in the case of the Chihuahua Santa Fe, Missouri trade, Mexican exports consisted largely of silver, although hides and wool also headed out to the American ports. The growing shipping between Matamoras and New Orleans in time created a commercial central that, as in the case of Paso del Norte, drew young enterprise, I'm sorry, young entrepreneurs from Europe and the United States, such as 18-year-old Connecticut native Charles Stillman, who arrived from New Orleans in 1828 and and became involved in a broad range of business activities in Tamaulipas and Nueva Leon. American businessmen such as Stillman, who established themselves in Matamoros in the 1820s and 1830s, eventually turned their attention to the American side of the border, where during the, the 1840s and 1850s, they acquired sometimes in quite shady ways title to much of the land granted by Spain and Mexico in the pre previous century. For Pesanos, as the residents of the Paso del Norte areas were known developments in far off Texas, were little more than news of mild interest but of little direct consequence. For Tamala Pecos, that is the residents of the country below the lower Nuecos River. Events in Texas were of great consequence. Many of the residents of the river towns from Laredo to Matamoros had participated in military actions in Texas during the Mexican War of Independence. Many too had suffered from raids by Indians from Texas and had an interest in developments in the neighboring state that might make life more peaceful. Increasingly, Tamalcas had business contacts with the Texans, both Tejanos and Anglos. And of course, there were many Anglo-Texans and Americans who saw everything north of the Rio Grande as part of Texas and no part of the Tamalpas at all. It, is no surprise that when the Texas Revolution began, some of the Texans adventurers hoped to conquer Metamoros, Texas. <clears throat> the Age of the Impresarios, 1821 to 1830. By the time that the political reorganization of Mexican North America North under the Constitution of 1824 took place, the transformation of Texas into an extension of the American Cotton Kingdom had begun. The, this transformation was abetted by and facilitated by Mexican policymakers, particularly te Tejanos, who saw in a settlement program under officially sanctioned promoters, empresarios, the best hope for attracting productive farmers and planters. 
Not all settlers who came did so under the auspicious of an impresario, and not all the impresarios had the best of intentions. However, by the 1830 Mexican reservations over the wisdom of the experiment would le lead to the first efforts to stop immigration from the United States. Austin's Colony The first and most successful of the impresarios was Stephen Fuller Austin, or Estevan, as soon as, as he soon started signing his name, having grown up in a family of frontier entrepreneurs, having received a good basic education, and having acquired some military and public service experience, Stephen was well prepared for the challenge ahead. In December 1820, he was in New Orleans beginning an apprenticeship in law when he received a letter from his father explaining the Texas colonization project and asking for his help. Austin's first trip to Texas in summer of 1821 went well enough to convince him of the project's potential. The land he inspected along the bottoms of the Brazeros and Colorado rivers were perfect for an agricultural settlement. After visiting with Governor Antonio Martinez one last time to work out the details of individual grants, Austin left for New Orleans to recruit colonists, the first of whom arrived in December 1821. Unfortunately, when in early 1822 Austin returned to Bexar to report on the colony's progress, Martinez informed him that he was acting outside the law. Austin must obtain the approval of the new government in Mexico City. Austin's time in the new nation capital might have discouraged a less determined man, although he presented the order from the provincial deputation authorizing his father to establish the colony and the agreement that he and Governor Martinez made regarding the location of the colony and the size and terms of individual grants. Little happened, in fact. Austin's experience was experienced the waste of time and effort that marked the first Mexican empire. In August, he even wrote out a scheme of government, never presented, that he prefaced with a, a reapproach. As a citizen of this empire, one, I should be wanting in my duty, did I not feel that anxiety for the common welfare of my country, which ought to animate the bottom of every good man. I have therefore viewed with great interest the political agitations of the, the nation, and particularly of this capital, for the last two months, and believing that the evils which now embarrass the operation of government arise solely from a def defect in the organization of the legislative department. I have taken the liberty to offer my ideas on the subject. After a turbine <clears throat> dissolved Congress at the end of October, Austin lamented, lamented these people will not do for a republic. Of the, out of the turmoil, however, came the Imperial Colonization Law of 1823, which set up an impresario system that surpassed Austin's initial expectations. It offered a square league or sitio of 4,428 acres to each family involved in stock raising and labor, unit of cropland of 177 acres for families farming operations. Not surprisingly, all settlers claimed to be stock raisers. It provided other inducements as well, such as seven year moratorium on import duties and the ability to pay a minimal cost on the land in installments. Impresarios would not receive payment for, the, for their colonization efforts from the government until they had settled at least 200 families, at which point they would receive choice lands of their own. The law made clear that the land included the, in the colony contract I'm sorry colony yeah colony contract was not the impresarios and that a commissioner representing the government would 
be responsible for issuing titles. Till then, the law allowed the impresario to charge moderate fees to offset <clears throat> surveying and administrative costs. As it turned out, although there were a number of individuals in Mexico City lobbying for impresario deals, the only contract issued under the imperial colonization law was Austin's first. During the period from 1821 to 1824, Austin exceeded the 200 fa family requirement for his own land. And by 1827, he approached the projected number of settlers with 297 families, later referred to as the Old 300. By the terms of the settlement laid out in 1823, there were to be of unblemished character, good morals, sobriety, and industrious habits. They were also supported to be Catholics. For the overwhelmingly Protestant settlers, this was a conversion in name only. As a group, Austin's colonists had high literacy rates for the era and were people of some means. Of those he had settled by the fall of 1825, 69 families possessed slaves who made up 25% of the colony's population. Of 1800, Jard Gross of Alabama, the wealthiest col colonialist, brought with him 90 bondsmen whose labor quickly helped him consolidate his wealth and position in their new location besides the Brazos. Austin ran his colonial project from the town of San Felipe de Austin, perhaps the last Texas town intentionally named for a Catholic saint, as the name was proposed by Commandment General Felipe de la Garza to honor both his patron saint and Stephen F. Austin. It was his the first Anglo-American town to be granted an, an Allende, to Miento, and it was the first to have a formal militia. The impresario was responsible for everything, including justice, defense, until suitable civil institutions were authorized. Fortunately for Austin, in overseeing the colony's governance, he had been able, he had the able assistance of Samuel May Williams a Rhode Island native who had learned Spanish in South America. Williams was not the only Austin secretary. He managed the colony affairs while Austin was away on business and also served as secretary of the Arriamento to San Felipe, which in effect was the capital of Austin, Tex Austin's Texas. Other colonizing efforts. Even before he had completed the terms of his first contract, Austin set to work to obtain the right to introduce yet more settlers. These contracts, as well as these, those made to most other world be, would be impresarios, may, were made under the State Colonial Colonization Act Law of 1825, the features of which generally followed the provisions of the Imperial Law of 1823 and adhered to the strict Strict, strictures of the national law of 1824. The most important provision of the state law was the elimination of the separate 177 farming allotment, making the maximum size of a family grant 4,428 acres. It would be the responsibility of the governor to appoint a commissioner to issue titles to the to the settlers in the name of the state and col colonists could not dispose of the land for six years among the early impresario contracts issued by the governor government of cohia e texas the most significant after austin's was the that of green dewitt in 1825 dewitt a former missouri sheriff with the help of austin and the baron de Bastrop, who had become commissioner, sorry, commissioner for Austin's first contract, was awarded a grant bordering Austin's on the west and was authorized to locate 400 families on the Guadalupe. The seat of the colony became the town of Gonzales, 
which was originally founded in 1825. But after Indian Attacks was relocated it, to its present site in 1827, unfortunately the confused circumstances of the early stages of land distribution, the boundaries of DeWitt's contract overlapped with those of Martin de Leon. The lone successful Mexican impresario, de Leon had received his authorization to establish a settlement from the provincial deputation in early 1824. Before the merger of the Cohia and Texas, therefore it was granted after Austin's contract with the Turbides Empire, but before DeWitt's contract with the state, in fact, de Leon, a native Tamaulipas, had petitioned the Spanish government as early as 1807 to settle in South Texas with the onset of the Mexican War of Independence. He'd withdrawn below the Rio Grande, but in the early 1820s decided to make another go at establishing a ranching operation in Texas. In 1824, he received a contract to locate 41 Mexican families on the lower Guadalupe River, a settlement named in honor of the first president of Mexico. Nostra Señora Guadalupe de Jesus Victoria, soon known simply as Victoria, served as the colony's seat of government, despite boundary and other disputes. With DeWitt's colony, De Leon established a prosperous ranching-based community that eventually totaled over 150 grants. Between 1825 and 1829, the state awarded various impresarios contracts covering most of Texas and because of imperfect knowledge of the interior, well beyond that were supposed to be the state's borders, although Texas would claim those lands as late as 1850. Only a handful produced results, James Power and James Houston, Irish businessmen who had located in the Cohia after independence in 1828, received a contract to settle both Mexican and Irish families in the coastal area between the La Vaca and Guadalupe rivers. John McMullen and James McLoyne, also Irish merchants in Mexico, took over a failing impresario contract in 1828 and brought Irish settlers to their colony in the brush country of South Texas, just north of the Nueces River. By 1834 and about 250 Irish families had settled in power of and Houston Houston's colony centered at Refugio and in McMullen and McGloin's at San Patricio. Most impresarios, however, had little success in attracting significant numbers of settlers. In 1822, Sterling Robertson, a Tennessee plantation owner, joined other stockholders in a Texas association planning a settlement in Mexican, Texas. In 1825, his colleague Robert Leftwich secured a contract to settle 800 families in what is now Central Texas, but was unable to follow through. Robertson continued his attempts to recruit settlers in Tennessee and Kentucky but was not able to advance the colonization under his own name until the 1830s. By the time he did, Samuel May Williams had gotten state government to turn the contract over to him, and Austin and protected legal battle ensued that lasted beyond Texas independence. The sordid tale of the Galveston Bay and Texas land Company reveals the unscrupulous behavior of some impresarios and the American land speculators who hoped to take advantage of what appeared lawless conditions in Mexican Texas. In 1826, David G. Burnett, a New Jersey native, Ohio lawyer, and Louisiana trader with the Comanches and the Brazos, and Joseph Vahilin. A German merchant in Mexico received contracts to settle 300 families each in East Texas. In 1828, Vahelen received an additional contract for 100 families south of the first one. 
In 1829, Lorenzo de Zavala, one of the Mexico's most prominent statesmen of the independence period, obtained an impresario contract for 500 families. Between Vahalans and Sabim, the Sabim, fa failing to find the means to carry out the projects in 1830, the three men signed over their contracts to the New York-based Galveston Bay and Texas Land Company, but the transactions was a clear violation of their contracts with the state government. Worse, the company then turned around and started selling land scrip certificates for blocks of land. Instead of locating settlers within the colonies, not only was the sale of scrip illegal, since the company did not own the land, but it did so after the Mexican Congress had passed the law of April 6, 1830, which voided all impresario contracts not substantially fulfilled. Yet the actions of the Galveston Bay and Texas Land Company were most uh, were not mo the most egregious actions by an impresario. This will be the end of Chapter 5, Part 1. Thank you.